Vale, vale, vale. Para metrizando, yo le contaré eh, un poco por encima de lo que estaba haciendo con los carnales, pero creo que dedicarle un mini ratito a. Perfecto, pues voy a dedicarle un mini Yo ni siquiera tengo el slide, no tengo el buen Yo que esté. I don't Wageningen, yeah. Wageningen. Yeah, that's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we used to go every year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, many yeah, yeah. people from Wageningen would come because. I heard we, about that. Yeah, oh, yeah. you never been? Never been no. because I I did most of my oh. I kind of escaped. Uh, I did my PhD. In Scotland, so I, I oh, disappeared. Did you, oh, okay. I disappeared you, after my masters. So oh, okay. I, I no, sorry, I thought that, that you did your. No, no, yeah, yeah. no. Okay. What did you study? You studied chemistry? Or... Uh, biotechnology. Right? Biotechnology. Yeah. Yes, okay. So <laughs> yeah. it was not only the masters, but. Yeah, yeah, masters and, uh, and uh, bachelor's combined, kind of. Yeah. Okay. No, okay, no, okay. Yeah. Do I have to go up there? Or can I send to you? Uh, for the audio, I don't know. For the audio online, oh, it's, it's fine. It's, it's okay. Fine. It's fine. Yeah, amazing. So, yeah, that's good. So, you're going from Vision. I don't know about Vision. I don't know if you know. No, I I don't know if you know. What can you do? Yeah, for sure. Shall we start? Okay, so welcome everyone for the seminar. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Ryan Ulain, who uh, was my PhD uh, supervisor a few years ago. Uh, so it's very special for me. Uh, just to give you an introduction about his career, uh, he studied uh, biotechnology at Bagh uh, in very good. Okay. Uh, in, in the Netherlands, but uh, then moved to, to a Strathclyde in Glasgow uh, to, to do his to, to his PhD in physical chemistry, uh, postdoc in, in Edinburgh, but then he started his independent career in 2003 in, in Manchester. Uh, then be back in Glasgow and, uh, from 2008. Uh, until he was appointed at City University of New York to start a nanoscience initiative in, in the Advanced Science Research Center, uh, where he is now, he's the, the director of the nanoscience initiative. And well, uh, there is a, 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 a long list of awards. I think that uh, maybe one of the most important is that he's an elected fellow of the Royal Society in, of Edinburgh. Uh, he has the Royal Society Merit Award and uh, the ISC uh, Norman Hitley uh, Medal. And his research is uh, really interesting. Uh, I think a good uh, definition, I don't know, used to be our minimalistic peptide self-assembly, but he has moved uh, towards uh, peptide material systems uh, chemistry. And I'm sure that we will all enjoy the talk. So hopefully. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Van. And uh, yeah, thanks for uh, uh, the opportunity to be here. Um, I've had a really, a really fun day, actually. I try to use these trips as kind of mini vacation idea because, you know, life is busy, so it's always nice to uh, visit nice people, learn a few things. And yeah, obviously super proud of uh, Ivan that he's uh, handed up here. So I think it's a great, great home for him. For him. Um, 
So yeah, so I'm gonna I have I don't know thirty something slides, and we'll we'll see how far we go. I'm quite happy to for this to be interactive. If people have questions or want something to be to to focus in a little bit more on one specific aspect, for me that's all uh, completely uh, flexible. Um, so, but the uh, I guess the summary. Let me see how this works. So, is there a pointer on this as well? No, I don't. Seems to be fun. Okay, so it's okay. I don't know what I'm doing to this, but it's fine. Um, so the summary of my work is basically that um, 20 amino acids and I guess a handful of uh, monosaccharides and some lipids can make everything and anything, which is quite remarkable. You know, you look at life and um, it's made of of just a really very small number of uh, of building blocks relatively and um, of course life is made of this so you can think about the whole thing as a kind of reductionist you know let's pull life into small pieces and you end up with amino acids we're kind of interested in the opposite approach starting with amino acids and see what you can build and then you can you can build but ultimately hypothetically you can build a living thing clearly we have no idea how to do that but uh, but you can also make many other things. And I think that is that is the opportunity, I think, right now, that because, of course, amino acids and any anything bio can be locally produced anywhere. We have sunlight and CO2 available. So thinking about, like, the circularity and how you can make basically anything and break it back down to its building blocks, I think this is a really amazing system for that. But you know that said, we're making very much baby steps. So mo most of what I'm going to talk about today is um, a very short peptides, dipeptides, tripeptides, pentapeptides, and mixtures of them. And uh, my, to be honest, the one thing that hopefully everybody will take away from this is that this is an incredibly uh, versatile space to work and and design. So that's that's my introduction. I'm going to give you some examples of ongoing research in the lab. So what I'm trying to do is give you a lab tour, essentially. So I'm not going to talk too much about really old stuff. So Ivan's stuff is not going to feature. It's not that it's really old, but you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about things that we're doing uh, today, and some of it's published, some, some of it's not. And so I look forward for, to some feedback as well. Um, so, and I learned that uh, Donos, Donostia is actually the name for San Sebastian. I did not know that. I was very confused by seeing these kind of interchangeably used, but I, uh, that's, that's one thing that I uh, picked up for my, my visit. I don't know why this is now not going forward. Okay, there we go. So this is the reason why, so I'm obviously from the Netherlands and I did most of my, my career in the UK. And uh, now 10 years ago, I decided to make to, the move to New York. I had no plans of moving anywhere, but they, uh, I was asked to come and take a look at this new center that they were creating in Manhattan. And I, um, I basically went there and I called my wife afterwards and she could tell from my voice, uh, she said, are we moving? And I said, yeah, I think we're, we're moving. So it was crazy, like a big adventure, and it's been a lot of fun. So I started off, so I, the first time I visited that building was was empty, completely empty. It was still, you had to wear a hard hat to, to, to be able to look around in it. And um, it's a, uh, it, 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 you know, a lot of the things I see here is what we have too, uh, connection between the disciplines, um, you know, facilities that people can come and use, like experts in different techniques and then working together to do amazing things. So it's very different from a traditional university where you have like, you know, there's chemistry, there's physics, there's biology, just the integration and the access to many different techniques is just uh, incredible. So in our building, we have uh, nano, which is what I'm responsible for. We have an entire floor dedicated to photonics. So there was actually a lot of potential connection. We talked about that before with Nano Gune. There was a lot, and I saw today as well, there's a lot of photonics in the uh, material center here. Then we have a, a floor dedicated to structural biology, and then neuroscience and environmental science. So it's like a, a crazy playground of, uh, of science. Um, so very fun. So if you have the chance to come to New York, uh, come and visit us. Um, 
some people wonder how can you can possibly have something like this in Manhattan. So I don't know if anyone's been uh, recently, but you know, if you've been to New York, you've been probably, you see at the very end on the right hand side, you see the Empire State Building. So we're on the north side, so we're north of Central Park in, in Harlem. So that's that's where we are. So the, the strip of green that you see, that's Central Park. So we're, we're north of Central Park. So there's life north of Central Park. There's cool things happening there. Next time you come to New York, send me an email and we'll happily uh, host you. Um, okay, so, so this is what I tried to say earlier. I think there's a reasonable question and I think the answer is yes, everything can be made from biomolecules, but it's just a very, very difficult problem. But I think it's one worth thinking about. And all the examples on the screen here are things we, we developed in my lab based on very short peptides. So the first one is mimics of melanin, and I'm not gonna talk about that today, but you use tripeptide self-assembly and then uh, enzymatic oxidation to make uh, things that are like melanin can be used for cosmetic uh, applications. Um, drug delivery, I'm going to uh, talk about that a little bit. So we've been using short peptides to help solubilize hydrophobic drugs. It's a big problem. You know, many drugs don't make it because of their very poor bioavailability. So we use short peptides to rescue some of these drugs and make them bioavailable. Tissue scaffolds, we worked on, it's kind of dropped that, but that's something we did uh, uh, also when Ivan was still, still in the lab. Uh, energy harvesting, I'm going to show you some of that. We, we harvest evaporation energy uh, and turn it into mechanical uh, force. Biodegradable plastics is a big one for us. And uh, emulsifiers and many, many other things. Uh, batteries, displays, electronics is not something we do, but other people are working in, in that, uh, using biomolecules for these purposes. I'm doing something wrong with this liquor. I don't know why it's... Okay. So this is the overall idea. Yes, we like biology, but for this approach, we actually don't really care about what biology has come up with. We simply say 20 amino acid building blocks. We think about the properties and then we use integrated experiments and um, uh, molecular dynamic simulations to try to find so, you know, useful, uh, simple peptide modules and then make materials out of it. So it starts really with properties, you think, well, you want to make something that self-assembles, then, uh, and then and then take it from there. Then select your sequence space and find uh, suitable. Um, and I'm going to take you. This is kind of where we started. So I said I was only going to talk about new work. This is the only old thing, but this is really what started us. What gave me actually a lot of confidence in um, in molecular dynamics approaches to to do what we're we're trying to do. So this was work with. Tel Tuttle, who was um, uh, Ivan's other supervisor, um, and uh, Pim Fredericks was the, the, the student then who, who did most of this work. And the question was very simple. So we were interested in hydrogels for many different applications. At that time, we worked with FMOC protected peptides. So, you know, it's basically a, uh, a skip the, the cleavage step of the FMOC group during a synthesis, and you get a very uh, good self-assembler so that there's a lot of research on FMOC peptides. But the question with FMOC peptides is always, well, you know, is this going to be biocompatible? Is this going to be useful for anything? Because you've got this non, you know, this flat aromatic uh, fluorinyl group that, that may, may not be that good. So we wanted to drop that. I mean, basically, had that very simple question. Can we make hydrogels out of tripeptides? So it starts with, so tripeptides will give you a sequence space of 20 to, to the power of three, right? 20 building blocks times 20, times 20 so 8,000. And um, so we think about the requirements. So you need something, you want your peptide to recognize copies of itself to mo make long strands. That's one requirement. And the other requirement is you want them, and Ivan knows this really well, you want to make sure that uh, the, 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 the assembly interacts favorably with water. It kind of needs to have some polar groups at the surface because otherwise it's going to crash out. So two simple rules, high aggregation propensity and a polar interface. And that's the only thing that we, we that, that that we put into this this system. And then these are martini, I guess if this is martini 
2.0 or even before, I don't know. I think it's 2.2 here. 2.2. So and basically run 8,000 uh, computations uh, simultaneously, you know, a few hundred uh, tripeptide molecules in the box, uh, explicit water, and then basically let it, let it uh, equilibrate. And then, so, yeah, so think about having 8,000, uh, showing four here, but 8,000 of those, you know, it took about two weeks to complete that, that simulation. And you can immediately see some differences. So GGG, three glycines, doesn't self-assemble very much. PFF forms these kind of compact globules. And KYF and KFD seem to form like something that starts to resemble maybe some kind of fiber architecture. And then in panel C, you can basically see 8,000 dots, um, or each of them representing one simulation, where we look at the aggregation propensity. So it's the solvent accessible surface area at the beginning of the experiment uh, 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 versus at the end of the experiment. So of course, when you get high assembly, you lose a lot of interactions with the solvent. So ratio that, that gives you the aggregation propensity. And then on the other axis, we have the hydrophobicity. And this gives you a lot of information because remember each dot is also an entire uh, simulation. So this is a very powerful, and now, you know, what is it, one than 20 years later, not just less than 20, 20 years later, 10 years later, in fact, um, a lot of people are using this data set for uh, uh, machine learning, because it's a very, very powerful data set, even though we think we can do better with data sets now. But now, back then, I don't know, people thought it was probably a waste of time to try everything and find some interesting examples. But now there's a lot of need for data. And so we really feel that that, that computation and simulations can be very powerful at providing the data that can ultimately inform experiment. Uh, so anyway, uh, so going back to this, so you see PFF all the way at the top. So that's the more strongly self-assembling molecule. Um, and then in green, we basically have the sweet spot that is kind of between high aggregation propensity, but also that polarity that we need. So the hydrophobicity is kind of in the right range. So then uh, we basically went to the lab and made um, about 20 of these. And long story short, this is basically just a different way of showing the 8,000 tripartites. So amino acid one, amino acid two, and then in each box, amino acid three. And you can see there's a, a wide variety, the intensity of just also the darker, the, the higher the assembly propensity. And long story short, we found the first um, tripeptide hydrogenators, like KYF and, and, and related uh, molecules that form beautiful fibers, interact favorably with the solvent and form, form gels. So um, then on to today. So Duanit joined my lab and he decided to revisit some of, some of that stuff. So, so these TM images were kind of buried in the supplementary but you can probably see, I don't know, this is immediately evident that there are some differences there. Fibers, 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 and not very clear for KYW, right? Um, and the, the coarse grain uh, Martini 2.2, I guess it was, uh, gave similar aggregation propensities for all of these, KFF, KYF, KYY, KYW. What we're doing here is playing around with the aromatic uh, amino acid. And um, so when you look at KFF, KYF, KYY, they actually all form kind of opaque gels. KYW actually is soluble all the way up to one molar. So it's, it's crazy, or it looks soluble anyway. It stays transparent. And so, you know, just changing from KYY tyrosine to KYW tryptophan completely changes the assembly. And the coarse grain molecular dynamics doesn't, doesn't capture that. So Dwanit looked at... Um, at um, uh, atomistic uh, simulations, and he basically looked at all all di uh, uh, all, all tripeptides, uh, not all tripeptides, all dipeptides, and, and a, a number of, of tripeptides. But you can see here in panel C, what we what he's done there is separate out the backbone backbone hydrogen bonds. They're they're in blue, and then in red you have the backbone side chain hydrogen bonds. So, of course, with tryptophan, you start to introduce a new uh, uh, hydrogen bond interaction possibility in the side chain. And you can see that basically from KFF to KYF, KYY, KYW, the backbone interaction becomes less 
prominent, so it's less tendency to form one-dimensional bedding sheet-like structures. And uh, the side chains become more and more prominent. So it's irisync and hydrogen bonding and, and, and tryptophan more so. And the overall ag aggregation propensity goes up, going from KFF, KYF, KYY to KYW, but the distribution is different. And the consequence of this, so in B, you see some snapshots of the simulation. KFF forms these, these, these fibers, as you, you, you would expect. But KYW actually forms uh, 3D. Uh, so it doesn't grow in 1D. It, 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 it basically goes in all directions. So it's very different, um, a very different system in that sense. And the, the cartoon is meant to show that you, know, you either have 1D assembly or this 3D kind of more space filling assembly. And it's interesting because when you look at the design of five of, of self-assembling uh, structures based on peptides, the focus is very often on the backbone interactions, like mimicking a baby sheet, alpha helix, collagen, whatever. The side chains are actually super important, especially when you keep the things so 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 simple. Okay, so this has some consequences because in KYW, you it looks transparent and flows like water, but you have basically these 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 uh, dispersed, uh, dis dispersed um, uh, dynamic uh, objects. Okay, so then, so the experiment here is basically then comparing what happens when you when you when you uh, when you um, self-assemble these structures. And the self-assembly in this case was achieved by drying. What happens when you dry a droplet of this material? We put like 20 millimolar in a, in a solution. And then upon drying, you, you basically uh, increase the concentration, right? You lose solvent, so the, the concentration goes up. And then something very interesting happens. Oh, I do have a point, it's just right. Uh, you can see with KFF, KYY, uh, KYF, um, you basically get fibers formed, as you would expect, in the drying droplet. But with KYW, something very different happens. Um, so the movie will start, hopefully. Oh. That wrong one. Maybe it just needs to have the. Uh... So we're looking at the edge of the the what the the droplet with twenty millimolar of this material. Yeah, it starts now. Thank you, Ivan. And this is what you see. So upon drying, you see, like a like a, a, a kind of a crazy. Um, self-assembly phenomenon where you get lots of spherical objects formed. Um, and this is this is um, uh, something that we see uh, actually with quite a few different peptides that have tryptophans and, uh, and, and, and charged amino acids. So we think, and then when we looked at the SCM of this, you already saw a snapshot of that. It's, it looked like this. So this is basically, so, so, so any idea of what we're looking at here? It took us a long time to figure out what was actually going on here. You see that these structures are look very flat. I think depending on your cultural background, they look like different things. Does this look like anything to anyone here? It's kind of an experiment I'm doing with different audiences. <laughs> Pancakes? Pancakes, I heard that, yeah. So in the Netherlands, pancakes don't look like that, but yes. Pancakes, anything else? I heard like a, a, a lotus root, you know, that has, has these. And uh, yeah, if, um, I don't know, I had the other day, I had someone who came up with something very creative. But anyway, they're, they're flat. So it's, it, and you can see a lot of them are spherical underneath, small. And then you got these flat, uh, flat porous structures at the top. So it took us a long time to figure out why this was and whether this was an artifact. We found them all the time. We also found it by, by AFM. So now, we figured out what's going on, and so we believe it's it's um, so having the tryptophan there. Tryptophan likes interfaces, so tryptophan seems to accumulate at air-water interfaces and also at liquid-liquid interfaces. 
And uh, when you look actually in biology, uh, membrane proteins that have tryptophan are not super common. It's one of the least common amino acids. But in membrane proteins, when you have tryptophan, they're near, nearly always at the interface. So there's something about tryptophan, and we have a lot of it here that basically seeks the interface and stabilizes the interface. And uh, so what happens upon drying of the droplets, the first thing that happens is a liquid-liquid phase separation. And then um, uh, inside the liquid droplets, we get air bubbles formed, again, because of an air-liquid uh, uh, interface uh, stabilization. And as a result, these droplets now, so normally when you get liquid, liquid phase separation, I know um, some people here are familiar with the phenomenon. Normally these things um, have a higher density and they go to the bottom. But now we have all these little air bubbles inside, they actually go up. So they hit the, the, the roof of the droplet. So they go up and they have all these holes in them, the little air bubbles in them, they hit the roof of the droplet and there they deform and then they solidify. And that's how we end up with these crazy uh, disc-like uh, structures. And you can see them as well in AFM and you can see them, that's a FIB SEM to show that these are um, uh, real and, and um, and, and you, you may or not, not be able to see panel F. They're also very stiff. These things are about six, between six and eight uh, Young's modulus, six, eight gigapascal. So it's like similar to wood or bone. So these are very, very stiff structures that form. Um, and then when you actually do it under air-free conditions, so simply we pull out the air with vacuum before, you don't get the crazy flat structures because now they don't rise to the top and you can actually get like what looks like a beautiful um, emulsion um, experiment. So it's a way, so we're not putting any mechanical energy into this. This spontaneously forms these huge amounts of tiny droplets and then solid particles. So it's kind of a remarkable thing because emulsion is normally, you really have to put a lot of energy into it to you know create new interfaces, this, this does so uh, spontaneously. And you can play around with the size um, and the spherical nature by changing the temperature degassing and changing the, the buffer concentrations. So we try to do something, we try to think about something useful you can do with this. Um, so the experiments here show when you add GFP, so green fluorescent protein to the solution at the beginning, it turns out that all the, uh, the green fluorescent protein actually gets entrapped within the particles. And uh, you can then store it, so you can keep it there. And uh, the peptides basically interact, the cartoon shows the peptides basically interacting with the surface. If you think about any protein, it's very patchy, of course, in terms of its chemical, um, you know, the chemical properties. And these, these patches can be, be matched by this dynamic peptide assembly. So we think that the, the peptides kind of wrap themselves around the protein that protects the protein. So during the drying process, you then get, end up with these, these so solid particles with the protein inside that is protected. You can keep that dry. We tried up to five days. So we hope long, three months apparently has been tried, but I haven't seen those, those results. You can keep it dry, dry powder. And then when you add some water, it immediately goes back into solution. And, um, and, and so this is a way to store, uh, protect and store proteins. So we, the little dinosaur at the bottom is, we, we, uh, my, my postdoc started a, a company based on this concept. And she wanted to call it bio wrap because it's kind of wrapping the proteins. But that name was gone. So we came up with bio raptor and the, the very cool uh, dinosaur there. Um, and then, so this is a different, uh, so this is what I mentioned before at the very beginning. Uh, these are drugs, uh, 23 of them, and they come <laughs> from the, the freezer of my collaborator at Memorial Stone Kettering Cancer Center, which is a pretty, pretty amazing cancer center in New York City. Um, and I think if you, I, I know many of you are chemists, if you look at these structures, it's kind of no surprise that there's some issues with bioavailability. They don't look super compatible with aqueous environments. Um, so we, we, we hoped, you know, we figured that maybe peptides can come to the rescue. Uh, so, you know, what you can do, of course, is entrap these in lipid, part, uh, lipid droplets. That's pretty common, you know, like with the, uh, the, co the COVID uh, vaccines, for example. Uh, but we feel that peptides can be a more, you know, chemically matched uh, opportunity there. 
So, um, and we uh, this started by, so Gia did this work and she was a, a PhD student between myself and Dan Heller at uh, MSK, the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And Dan had actually previously published on this molecule. Does anyone recognize that? It's like a near IR dye. So he, I think his objective was to use the near IR dye to find out where his drug molecules go. Because in a near IR, you can uh, image through the skin. And, but it turned out that that near IR dye actually co-assembles with some drugs. And then we thought, well, if that can do it, then peptides should definitely be able to do it. So we look at this and then we, we see well, I, I mean, it's the thing about peptides for so long that we see kind of peptide analogs. Um, and uh, that's what Gia did. She basically, you know, pull apart this near IR dye. You see like some indole-like moieties, see some charge. You see the backbone, which is kind of um, rigid. So we thought maybe some prolines. And then basically we thought, well, with lysine, aspartic acid, lysine, tryptophan, and proline, uh, we can probably mimic this in some ways. So she came up with three different scaffolds, uh, two of them, the, the one with the two pro, uh, proteins and then with the, the tryptophans either together or, or spaced apart. Uh, it's clearly only a very small uh, subset of the possible peptides that you can make from, from this, but she made eight of those. And then the idea is that screen the 23 drugs that, and then see which one form, or if, if any of them actually form uh, these, these nanoparticles. So that becomes a, so the thing on the left is just simply to show that our, the 23 drugs that we picked, uh, they are shown in yellow here. And this is a principal component analysis that looks at things like polarizability and, and electronegativity and other chemical parameters. The purple is basically all the FDA approved drugs. Uh, the pink, the, the, the orange yellow ones are the ones that we picked to, to cover a good sequence space, uh, 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 chemical space. And then in red are the, uh, the drugs, uh, sorry, the peptides that, uh, that Gia tested. So just to show if it works for the, this small number, it may be generalizable. That's basically the message there. And on the right are high throughput. Well, for my lab, this is high throughput in pharmacy. Of course, they would not think this is high throughput, but we have eight peptides, 23 drugs, and we look uh, at, well, first of all, particle size. So those are DLS experiments. And the darkest green is between 50 and 150 nanometers. So then you can see that there are a number, number of these formulations that make particles. Uh, in purple is the dispersibility. So what that simply means is that these drugs are very poorly soluble. So when you measure like UV vis, you see almost nothing. Then when you add the peptides, in some cases, they come into solution. So you start to see uh, good uh, dispersibility. So the, the, the darker, the, the better the dispersibility. And then if you combine these two, you have about seven candidates that look promising. And uh, we characterized um, a bunch of those. And uh, long story short, they indeed do form particles and the particles are very interesting in that they are the core of the particle is uh, the drug but the drug is the packing of the drug is somehow disrupted by the peptide so they become amorphous the drug is no longer crystalline so it means it's much better bioavailable available and most of the peptide is actually on the surface so you get a very thin layer of peptides on the surface and we feel that tryptophan again being a very versatile amino acid essentially digs into the, the, the this, this amorphous ball of drug and then presents the polar groups on, on at the interface. So that's how we think uh, these things uh, work. And it's it's kind of interesting because it's only, uh, it's like 98% of these particles is drug, just a very, very thin shell of uh, peptide. So we're excited about that. Um, uh, the paper will go back in on the 22nd of March, we agreed, because that's when I'm going on my family vacation. And I hope we, our reviewers will agree that this is worth publishing, that we're excited about. It. They've been tested also, I'm not showing that, but in uh, uh, mouse experiments, and they uh, reduce tumor bur burdens with drugs. Yeah. So these drugs are distinct to be uh, administrated orally or directly to the blood? This system. is actually uh, intravenous. 
Disagree. Yeah. So the one, the one we 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 tested. So we only took one because uh, you know the, our first paper is really about the chemistry, but we did want to show in Figure Five some proof of concept. So we picked a drug called. Um, Um, Lestartanib, which is a, um, a leukemia drug. So it actually doesn't go for solid tumors, but for soluble uh, tumors. So for that, that it's... Uh, okay, and I production. guess in that case, the stability of the peptide around the drugs, it still can uh, sustain until it reaches the target yeah i mean this is of course a very good question uh that uh that people often also ask like when you have peptides in a biomedical application doesn't it just like degrade but yeah uh, this seemed to work it's very hard to prove exactly when it degrades in a, in a mouse model but uh yeah what we think is also that uh, by, by having it like um, co-assembled with the drugs it may well reduce uh, the uh, you know the proteolytic cleavage, but you know we don't have direct evidence of that. But yeah, it's a it's a good question, um, and you can of course solve this issue potentially by using D amino acids or. But we yeah. we like L amino acids because you know they, it means that these these excipients can just break down, they can be metabolized essentially. So I think the you know if this ever is to go to FDA or something, they 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 will have less of a problem with that. But yeah, it's a, it's a it's a it's a good point. I think with self-assembling structures, Ivan probably has an opinion about that too. Um, with self-assembling structures, I think the proteolytic, uh, uh, you know, loss to proteolysis is 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 less of an issue than with free peptides. Uh, the, I'm sure it's the proof gets those questions too. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this is something very different. So if I lost you, this is the time to rejoin. Um, so my colleague, uh, Shi Chen, joined us um, at the uh, Advanced Science Research Center some years ago, and he is interested in uh, this idea of, um, so you look at that fine cone there. Um, I guess, she, you know, on a hot summer's day, when you see a pine cone, it can look something like that. And then you come back the next day when it's like today's weather, and it looks like that, right? It closes up, and it's these things are clearly not alive. It's purely because of the hierarchical structures inside these these things. And what Shi Chen is interested in is harvesting this evaporation, which is a free thing, happens day and night, all the time. Can we basically uh, harvest that energy? Um, and he he's a he's a mechanical engineer, so he likes to draw draw. Um, uh, uh, schematics like the one on the left uh, that essentially shows how this works. You've got nanoconfined water, and uh, that's mo uh, and and the, the, some of it is mobile, other other is structured. It's connected to a, a a spring system that can then release and and store energy. That's the idea, and that's and that's basically something. We thought would be cool to do with peptides. So you know, I, this thing I said at the very beginning, you know, anything can be done with peptides. I really believe that, but the question is then, you know, then someone says, okay, let's do it. <laughs> so we 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 started this. So Roxy did this work. Um, she looked at a whole bunch of peptides, but I'm going to show you the one that worked the best. Um, the requirements for a system like this is that you need aqueous nanopores, hydrogen bond re uh, regions. Periodic, stiff, and flexible regions. It needs to be hierarchical and anisotropic. And it turns out that HYF, the tripeptide, forms crystals that meet a lot of these criteria. You can actually see that immediately from the SCM. You can see it's highly anis anis anisotropic. You can see it's porous at the micron scale in this case. And if you then look at the, um, the actual crystal structure, oops, if you look at the crystal structure panel A here, um, it is also nano. Uh, it also has these aqueous nanopores. So in red, it's basically all water molecules. And if you look at the red regions, you can see basically all, you know, there's mobile water in the beginning. The, wa the waters at the, the edge are actually bound mm -hmm. to the wall of, the, of each pore. So you really have, and then plus, um, 
within the 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 pore lining the lining of the pore is all in um, hydrogen bonding contact so it's a little bit like a proton relay network that you may know from some enzymes you know like catalytic triad idea basically everything around the lining of the pore is in hydrogen bond contact the waters are connected to that and the waters in the middle are are, are freely mobile and the other thing to notice if you look outside the red pores you can see a lot of aromatics you see that they're kind of organized in threes. So you have these aromatics, like three phenyl, phenyl groups uh, together, or three uh, phenol groups together. And especially the, the phenol groups, they, they, they have this uh, propensity to basically move around with very little um, enthalpic consequence. So they, they, they can basically reorganize themselves uh, without uh, much energy cost. So the point here is, if you now start to pull on the waters in the middle of that pore, you know you reduce the, the humidity, you pull the waters out the middle. Now the, the, the lining of the pore basically can will 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 contract, and the the aromatics basically accommodate that. So that that was kind of the hypothesis why this uh, system should work uh, hopefully quite well. And then you can look at panel B. That's basically powder XRD. Showing uh, with uh, with uh, with the uh, relative humidity changing from 90 to 80 to 70 to 60, and then between 30 and 20 relative humidity, so it starts to be quite dry. You see suddenly loss of uh, crystalline order, and then when you go back up to to 30 again, so that's completely reversible. It snaps back into place. Um, so what's happening there is um, a strengthening of the hydrogen bond uh, network. Uh, as you as you you dry, and then I think this I don't know if this little movie already, but yeah. So this is a kind of a, a nice demo. So you see that little polymer film. So it's a a little thin film of polymer with the 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 peptide crystals glued on top, and we're basically just playing around with relative humidity, and you go go below and above thirty, and this thing starts to basically flex and convert hydration into mechanical. So these are actually quite uh, good actuators. The energy density is not so far from, uh, from muscle. So you can actually um, uh, potentially use this for something. Um, so yeah, so then we played around uh, with this. So Shihan came in and he looked at different peptide uh, structures. And what was interesting to us, so this metal structure is very famous. Uh, those of you working in peptide self assembly, I'm sure you've seen it before. Uh, that's the diphenylalanine structure, and and what is interesting there that is that is not responsive at all. It also has water pores, but in this case uh, the the structure is very stable, and uh, no matter what you do with the water inside these pores, it doesn't change into a mechanical actuation. And that actually, and then we found that phenylalanine, just the amino acid, is actually pretty good too. So that's a very cheap uh, variant. But the fact that FF doesn't work made us think that the importance, you see everything is zipped together, all these aromatics are zipped together, that that interface is really critical here. So we started to play around with things that, that biology does. So biology doesn't do uh, phenylalanine zippers very often, but it does do leucine zippers, right? So we started to look at and basically the difference when you look at diphenylalanine versus dilucine, the crystal structure has some similarities, but the behavior of these is very, very different as I'll show you in a moment. So they both have water pores, more in the FF compared to the LL. Um, but, uh, and so what, what, what Big Nash looked at here is um, basically the isoleucine leucine sequence space. So they're all just dipeptides. So, L I I I I L L L, and you can see that they all have you know different variants of leucine zippers, uh, uh, flexible regions. And the first observation is actually the solubility. You know when he was doing the crystallization experiments, it turns out that you know while FF is very insoluble, diisoleucine is highly soluble, seven hundred and thirty millimolar. Dilucine is like a hundred millimolar. So these things are you know, unexpectedly have really high solubility because you, you look at dilucine versus diphenylalanine, they're both very hydrophobic, but the solubility is very different. And it's because they form uh, much more dynamic uh, soluble aggregates. Uh, 
and uh, and 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 the other expect, unexpected thing is here that they're very strongly sequence uh, dependent. So we looked at Li in a bit more detail, um, and uh, this is a really remarkable experiment. It was very hard to do, so Vignesh did a great job. He could show that um, the Li uh, leucine isoleucine peptide can do. These are crystal actual crystal structures that you can see here. And we can basically, by playing around with humidity and temperature, we can access reversibly any three of the, those crystal structures. So the crystal is actually remorphing re and changing from one, um, one uh, architecture to another. Um, and you can see that these are, I mean, it can be much faster than this, but he, he's done a very careful experiment here. You're looking at the powder XRD, and basically the main thing there is one peak disappears and another one comes up. So it shows that by changing the uh, over time in uh, by uh, changing temperature or relative humidity, you can you can change one crystal morphology to another. When you look at Li two, Li two is layered. So here all the uh, he likes for for some reason uh, to give his to have his leucine isoleucine side chains in blue which I find a little bit confusing, but uh, so in blue, you can see these layers of uh, uh, the, the leucine and isoleucines uh, interacting. And then in uh, Li3 and Li2, they're much more like honeycomb structures, especially when you look at Li3. So that has very different, if you talk to mechanical engineers about that, that has very different mechanical properties and indeed, we can, we can switch back and forth between them by just playing around with humidity and temperature and actually go from something uh, that's much stiffer to something less stiff. So this is the, the experimental Young's modulus, very, very stiff for Li1, which is um, uh, this um, uh, honeycomb structure, Li2 much much lower, and then Li3 much higher again. So these are measured by, uh, by AFM by playing around with the, the humidity. And what's also interesting is that they have um, visible um, emission that actually tells something about the deplanarization of the, uh, the, the AMI backbone. So we can have a, have a direct readout of that. So the point here is that these crystals become, you know, dynamic morphable. And I think typically crystals, you think about one structure, but now, now it becomes. Um, and then this is a picture I saw today uh, earlier as well. So I know there was some interest in this. I, I know I need to, yeah. I'll, I'll wrap it up in a couple of minutes. Um, so uh, biomolecular condensates, that's kind of the other end of the spectrum from crystals where, you know, the focus is on disorder rather than order. And um, what you typically find, I mean, the way these things assemble is uh, they, 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 they have um, flexible linkers and, um, and then, you know, these, these adhesive groups that are called stickers so you have uh, so it's very different from a traditional you know the, the 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 protein folds into the protein structure falls into a into a sphere with polar groups on the outside a polar groups on the inside these have you know uh, uh, non covalent cross links through these stickers and then and then the spacer so we there's a lot of literature on this and i think every time you blink your eyes, there's another paper. This is like a field that's completely exploded because there's interest in biology. It's like a new phase in biology, even though it's been known in polymer physics for, you know, since 1920s, I think. Um, but anyway, so we thought, what can we do in terms of design here? So we look through as much of this literature as possible and try to extract some simple design rules and see if we can make things that do this uh, from scratch. So this, I think where I'm going to finish because I've got one more story after this, there's probably no time, but I want to share this because I know. Um, so Deborah did this work and based on, um, based on the, you know, what, what you typically find in a, in a spacer region, she started off with GSG. So, you know, glycine, serine, glycine is a very flexible uh, tripeptide. And as our stickers, we used arginine and tyrosine that are often found, found in these biomolecular condensates. So the, the sequence here is R and Y, and then separated by GSG. So it's R, GSG, Y, GSG, R, et cetera. So 22 amino acids long, because if you make it too short, it doesn't work for these. So that design didn't work. So it just gave, gave a, a, a solution. Then she 
picked, she's thought maybe we need some more hydrogen bonding interactions. So she swapped the GSG for SGS. And now we're basically tipping the balance too far. These are aggregates, we form soluble aggregates. And then she realized, I don't know exactly how, because it's not obvious from the, the protein literature, but she started to incorporate leucines to, to introduce a little bit of hydrophobicity in the middle of these spacers, and she can make droplets. So now you have liquid phases. So the, just to be clear, these, 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 these pictures here, you're looking at the surface. This is a microscopy image of droplets inside the liquid medium. So it's not like just rain droplets on a dry surface. It's a, a liquid medium, phase separation, droplets form inside, and they form pretty quick. In a few seconds, and you can see that because the the, uh, the, the you know the system goes uh, goes opaque. Um, so Dwanit uh, basically um, did atomistic molecular dynamic simulations to figure out a lot of things about this, and I don't have time to go into that. But he focused both on the role of water as on the role of the various interactions and the, the dihedral angles. So he basically could pull a lot of information out of this. The water interactions are very important. Uh, the leucine uh, system works because of the water interactions. And I can talk about that uh, after if you, if you, if you want. Um, but uh, we find, we learn about uh, so this is some some stuff that Juan had found. So we, we have this very unusual circular dichroism. Uh, the the GSG, the one that that forms those aggregates, uh, shows kind of a random coil. So that's I think the only one that that is as expected. The other ones have these positive yeah. small peaks, um, and it took us a while to figure out what that was. But those are actually uh, backbone, as shown in panel C, uh, antipi star transitions where the, you get some. Uh, when, the, when the backbone is in a certain orientation, you get basically the carbonyl interacting with the carbonyl carbon, uh, and that, that's a stabilizing interaction that uh, I don't know if you know about that, uh, Ivan. But, um, and um, then uh, the surprising thing about these is not, not only do they form droplets, they also show bright emission, and the emission is color sensitive, and we do not claim to understand exactly what's going on here. Uh, but we've seen it, you know, for multiple batches, so we know that this is real. We get either green or red emission, and uh, this is something to do with the hydrogen bond network that forms inside these droplets, and that incorporates uh, the arginine or, or histidine side chains in this case. They're fully dynamic still. We know that now we, we're doing more experiments, and we know that there's some oxidation playing a role here but they remain completely liquid. So it's a liquid form. And uh, so we're trying to now control this a little bit better, but we can make both you know, green and, and red emission. I know uh, Ivan's getting restless, so I'm gonna stop there. Um, I will tell you about, uh, I have one other little thing, but I'm just gonna skip that so we can get to uh, the conclusions. So, um, I think in the current time with everybody's talking about AI to the extent that it's getting like overhyped and you know what, uh, but, but I think actually robotics and automation and AI can be really powerful in this space. Cause I think our bottleneck is that it takes forever to do, you know, one series of experiments. So I think this is a pretty special time I think for this field because it's kind of ideal to optimize and figure out the sequence spaces uh, using using uh, automation and and you know a mixture of experiments and and computation, um, I uh, yeah and I think the other message is uh, and I think you guys do that really well here too that this is, lends itself really well to integrated computation experiments you know these shouldn't be separate worlds but working together you can. Do a lot. So we've been able to do self-assembly phase separation, actuation, catalysis, blah, blah, blah. We're looking at learning and memory now, which sounds crazy, but with mixtures of molecules, eventually, you know, of course, the brain is ultimately a mixture of molecules. So uh, at what point can you start to store information and retrieve it in, uh, in mixtures? So that's something I didn't really get a chance to talk about, but that's uh, where we're kind of going in the future. So with that, I'd like to thank my amazing team. Um, my collaborators, Ivan, again, for 
the invitation, the opportunity to, to visit. And uh, so, Stan, I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. Uh, it was uh, really nice to see the latest results in, in the group. Really amazing the direction that it, it is taking. Uh, so now, if uh, anybody wants to ask a question. Uh, in the first and in the last uh, uh, themes that you showed, you had at the beginning uh, arginine in the three peptide. Normally, it's always was arginine. At the end, it was, I think, lysine that you always needed to have in uh, to get this condensates. Um, and then at the beginning, you had the 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 K to get fibers or yes. some structures. Can you find some negative amino acid to do the same or? It must be positive. Uh, no, you can. So that's that's uh, yeah, it's, that's great. So the, yeah, I think there's two. So arginine is not the same as lysine. You know that. So th this is, I think, the other thing that that we're really learning. You know, there is a reason that biology has twenty. So sometimes we like to group them. Even when I color code them, it's like I put them together, like all the positive charges and negative. But you know, there's a lot of subtle differences. So yeah. Including between uh, lice, uh, lysine, arginine. Your question is: Can you do the same with uh, anionics? Yeah. Um, so we've we've done that with this. Um, uh, you know the 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 particles that form spontaneously and that wrap and trap the the proteins. So there we we thought there there's probably going to be a charge dependence. You know, if the the protein is is negatively charged, then you know the KYW will wrap itself nicely around it but if what about if the protein is positively charged so we started to look at that and for the, those experiments like a d instead of kyw you can use dyw and you get the same results so i think often you can do probably the same thing with the opposite uh, charge why we start with the the kyf i think it's all historic because our first gels were kyf so that's uh, but yeah it's entirely possible to do that with the opposite uh, charge but the condensates, I'm there. The, a lot of the driving force is cation pi interactions between the arginine or, or histidine and the, the tyrosine. So I don't know if there's an anion pi equivalent. Uh, that's not something we've looked at. So I'm not sure there. But most likely, I think, yes, you can probably uh, do something similar with a, a aspartic acid of the contaminant. Yeah. And can now, in the second one, with the uh, when you change the relative humidity and you saw three different crystal structures, yeah. If you want to translate that to mechanical work, yeah. I mean, what is the difference in volume? I mean, one would think that if you have difference in volume between these, yeah, yeah. you can uh, get work. Yeah, you showed maybe only the young modulus that was yeah. that was different. How would you translate that to mechanical work? Yeah, I mean that I have to say I would normally uh, ask my 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 collaborator to answer a question like that, but I can try. I mean, what what is the volumes as you mentioned are not the same. The water content is actually different in these hydrates. So you have, uh, and I think that's where 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 that opportunity comes in. So you have a chemical potential. Uh, with the water molecules, I think it's 2.5 for the most hydrated and 0 0.8 on average for the least hydrated. So I think that water going in and out. So similar to the the, the example I showed you, yeah. But yeah, that I think I mean they're kind of toy you know things now. They're not non immense power or anything. But uh, yeah, I think that's in future hopefully uh, where this can go. Thank you. As a follow up to Colin's question, uh, yeah. So I found like this switching between uh, different uh, uh, um, well crystal lattices, I yeah. guess, uh, uh, very surprising uh, because it seems to be something that's happening like in equilibrium. Uh, while well, well, I would expect that if you're thinking of a sort of nucleation growth model for crystal formation, once you've overcome the nucleation barrier, yeah. then it would be very difficult to uh, go, I mean, to jump back to another uh, arrangements. Yeah. Uh, so how is that possible without doing some sort of work or providing heat? You provide heat. So I'll show you. I'll go back to it. 
So you're going, uh, so here, here, here are the conditions. So the way to understand this, is, so this is just to show that you can, you can, you can access all, all structures. But if you look at the top, so you start off with the with the so the the the, the structure you get in a um, in, in just a crystallization experiment is uh, L, well at least so when you control it well we can get this L L I one structure as our start point, and then when you want to take L I one to L I two or to L I three, so you can look up on the on the right, you basically change the conditions. So when you increase the temperature to 55 centigrade, the relative humidity to 50%. You can go from Li2 to Li1. If you if you then change the temperature to 25 centigrade, much higher relative humidity, you can go from Li1 to Li2, et cetera. So you need to, you are providing, um, so you're changing the conditions. So you are moving around, because I think that's your question. You're moving around the energy landscape. But the, the key point here is with like the phenylalanine system, you can't because your your well is too deep and your 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 walls are too high, but with these leucine isoleucines because there's a lot of flexibility. To, so in these layers, so like like in these layers here, there's a lot of rotational entropy still. So so that's why these are these are actually happy to jump from one happy, but much easier to jump from one state to to the next. And we think that that's also proteins like that too. I think there's a reason why. Like leucine zippers are really not not common or even not known, I think, apart from an amyloid. Um, so yeah, so it's it's that, but yeah, you're putting energy in. Yeah. Let's let Marek uh yeah in principle that's uh what you can do i mean the 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 tricky part so that's the um yeah so the optical properties so here you can um i mean you can see um uh, so b corresponds to li1 and then c corresponds to li2 uh, uh d corresponds to li3 um in situ, following that, we have we have not been able. I mean, it's quite hard to uh, set up the experimental um, uh, conditions to very tightly control the relative humidity and do in situ fluorescence. I mean, for us anyway, that's that's uh, we haven't done that, so that's what it would require. But I, I'm pretty sure you can do that. Yeah. Could you, for example, follow the phase transition by uh, formation of the grains and the nucleus and then how they grow? Uh, or even the, during the, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And what's interesting there, so even before, so this 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 kind of double emission that you can see in panel two, you see that also actually in the solution before it even crystallizes. So the, the soluble nuclei, uh, so I think they, they, they form these kind of soluble aggregates with all the basically the hydrophobic parts coming together and then loosely the, the polar parts are more on the outside. And they already start to show some of these unusual optical properties because that's all amide uh, hydrogen bonding uh, 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 related. So to distinguish between that and when nucleation kicks in, I don't know if you can do that. It'll be very interesting to try that. Uh, but yeah, we so... Um, yeah, I don't know. Have, don't have an exact answer for you. We haven't done it, but I think I think it's possible. Uh, yeah, on the initial part of your talk, when you were uh, talking about the fibros that your tripeptides are yeah. forming, like KF, uh, KYF, KYY, we're making fibros, but then yeah. you find that KYW does not make an effect. Yeah. Something that you didn't uh, mention was uh, something that um, like the, the LLPS community is crazy about, which is this concept of aging. And I was wondering yeah. whether that's something that you see at all as differences between these different compounds, yeah. like that they will maybe first phase separate and then these three actually age while yeah. the KYW maybe sort of like forms uh, like a well, they separates, but yeah. also quite age. Uh, that I mean, uh, I think um, you, it's very likely true that because I think you're, you're finding, yeah, I guess you 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 know that that a lot of these fibrils, they 
the nucleate from a phase separated amorphous phase separated droplet. And then I guess your point is that maybe it's more a matter of kinetics rather than, or what, what is the role of kinetics in this? Uh, yeah, so we haven't studied that, but I'm pretty sure that with the K, you know, the, the, the first three essentially that that's the behavior you get, they just nucleate pretty quickly and then form fibers. KYW, we've never seen fibers. Um, but it doesn't mean that they will never form. But they, uh, yeah, I think what we do see also is that there is no, if you look at the, the FTIR, um, they don't have, they don't have a propensity for backbone hydrogen bonding. And that's basically simply because of competition, because you have a hydrogen bonding opportunity in the side chain in this case. Uh, so, but yeah, whether they uh, uh, indefinitely stay like in this amorphous state is uh, another question. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> okay. So in your like again, very nice talk. Thank you for that. So in your first uh, part of your presentation, like where you were having a flat, solid, yeah. very tight uh, and strong structures. Yeah. I have two questions there. Yeah. So are these structures porous or completely solid? They're porous. Yeah. So um, I go back. Yeah. So uh, panel C is actually fib SCML. You can't see it very well on the on the screen, but they're, they're, yeah, they have pores all the way through. Yeah, because these structures are very interesting, right? Because if they're coming from a liquid drying, yeah. like, normally you would imagine a, a, a sphere like, yeah. to minimize the surface tension. So I was imagining that maybe like, because you're talking about escape of bubbles, right? Yeah. So I can see these structures forming if you have a Janus structure that, okay, on one side you have your material and the bubbles have escaped to, to like coalesced into a drop. So one side is bubble, second side is molecule and the bubble pops and the interface. Oh, I in see, the... I see. Yeah, what we think is actually a little bit different in that they they, they um, so if you look at that, that the right side of panel A, we think that when they're still liquid with, with a lot of these, 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 these pores inside, and then they hit the air liquid interface to the top of the droplet, that there they deform and basically because of, uh, you know, uh, a surface tension situation, and that's why they flatten out to form but you you think you think something different? I think yeah, I think that because uh, like if there's continuous uh, escape of bubbles, yeah, then uh, I was just thinking that material should also be able to uh, reform itself, right, and reorganize to form a spherical shape. In principle, but the problem now is that it starts to hit the air water interface, you know, at the top of the the droplet. Yeah. So it goes from the liquid to the and 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 then because I think what you're proposing then is it, it, it would like I was just imagining if yeah, there would be a Janus stuff that yeah, yeah. the bubbles have come up onto the surface, like at the edge of your material. Okay. And the bubbles keep collecting them like they are uh, like they're forming a bigger bubble. Because I think the similar structures you would see in many uh like sharp boundaries in many uh colloids. Like David Fine's group and all. Yeah, yeah. So where they have something, and then uh, the escape or remove selective removal of a different polymer is oh, okay. I see. A sharp okay. structure like this. Otherwise, they mostly get a curve. Uh, okay. thing. So I was just thinking that maybe the presence of air does that for you. That okay. On one side you have bubbles, uh, and the second side is your material. And during evaporation, at some point when the bubble, like. Your system has organized into a structure, yeah, and the bubble pops, leaving this thing. Because if it was a continuous structure, I was imagining maybe the material should also, under self uh, surface tension, like try to regain uh, space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I see what you mean. Yeah, I think um, I just need to think a little bit more about that. I don't want to, but uh, yeah, obviously I can uh, I can look at uh, David Pines or go and talk to him. Uh, uh, nice, but, uh, yeah, thanks for that comment. I'll I'll think about it a little bit more. Very interesting. Okay, thank you.
Well, there are no more questions, please. Uh, Jamie, thank you, uh, Ryan, for his talk. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that's, yeah.